We'll get started in a minute or so, just waiting for some more people to come online. Thank you. All right, everyone. Let's let's begin. Uh, can you just give a hand signal if you can hear me? Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. To start out, um, oh, one sec. I'm just gonna bring up the prayer I wanted to do here. So I decided for the, the prayer today, we'll, we'll actually uh, pray one of the, the scripture passages that, that we covered. Um, this is Isaiah chapter 53, 1 through 3, and, and verse 12. So I'll, I'll read it for, for all of us here. In the, name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the many blessings you bestow upon us, and in particular, uh, this gift of your sacred word. May help us to always revere it and ponder it with hearts open to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome once again to those uh, who are doing the Bi Father uh, Mike Schmidt's Ascension Presses Bible in a Year. For those who are, are just starting or catching up, uh, maybe falling behind, uh, those who aren't reading or the the Scripture in a year, or but just want to tune in tonight. That's that's always great too. Um, good to have all of you here. For those of you who are keeping up, it is day two hundred forty five. Believe it or not. And we're still in the midst of the exile period. Um, so if you're, you're doing the checklist that comes with, with the Ascension Press Bible study, it's the blue, it's the blue exile period. We're, we're still in the exile period. It's a long period, same as last month. Um, we haven't, we've read a lot of scripture, but we haven't moved from a different period yet. We're still uh, very thick into the, into the prophets. But we are going to be... Um, rewarded soon you might say or at least a change of pace soon as we enter into another messianic checkpoint um as it's called in this in this podcast 
which means uh, a reading of one of the Gospels. And so in 12 days, just 12 days, we'll be reading the entirety of the Gospel of Matthew. We'll, and we'll read the entirety of the Gospel of Matthew in nine days. So that's a that's a coming attraction coming up here. So if uh, you're maybe perhaps a little wearied from the, you know, the, uh, the words of the prophets, the, the rebukes of the prophets, we'll, we'll be soon coming to our Lord. Um, but I think as we as you probably have seen, and certainly I did through these, this past month, there are many good passages and uh, very many special passages uh, that we see in these in the prophets. And I think there's a lot of certainly a lot of um, uh, rebuke from the prophets, but but signs of hope too. Um, a lot of a lot of signs of hope. A lot of very consoling passages, and really. Refreshing, refreshing for the soul. Some of these passages that we hear in the prophets, and maybe they're even more refreshing because they come in the midst of of rebuke and of um, kind of lamentation, uh, words of woe. But you have these incredible passages, ones that we probably have heard. Um, we hear in the mass around the holidays, around Easter, um, around the Passion, uh, Good Friday. So hopefully, you've, I'm, I'm sure as you've as you've read these or listened to them. Um, They've kind of stuck out to you. Sometimes we get to a certain passage. Okay, I've heard this before. This sounds like something familiar. Um, It's kind of like you're you're kind of at home in the scriptures when you when you find that recognition. A little a little review from last time because we're still in the same in the same area of exile. What is exile? I loved uh, what that uh, Jeff Cavins, who helps Father Mike out with the podcast, he he kind of has a nice spiritual way of describing it. That exile really is picking you up and bringing you physically to where you are spiritually picking you up uh, and bringing you physically to where you are spiritually. That is, in the case of, of the Israelites, far away from the presence of God, right? So they were in this um, Babylonian exile is really what, what our readings consist of uh, for, the last, for the last month here. We talked about, before that, the exile from the Assyrian Empire in the, in the 700s BC, and the complete, you know, the northern kingdom is gone. It was completely wiped out, you know, the northern ten tribes completely gone from the Assyrian Empire. Um, and then more recently, and it's still a long way from us, but more recently in uh, 597 BC, you have the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonian exile. And then these other, these other um, phases of the Babylonian exile of the Jews going to, to Babylon uh, around 587, 86 BC. And I think the next one, the final one is 582, 581 BC. Um, each time you kind of get more people going out to Babylon. The exile ended in 538 BC. So then actually people in Babylon, some came back to Jerusalem um, and to kind of help build it up and and build another temple. The first wave uh, of the exile was um, associated with the prophet Daniel and the second one with Ezekiel. Uh, So that's that's something that Father Mike, Mike points out a few times. And we might try to jog our memories again of, of what a prophet is. Often we think of prophet as, as someone who, who tells the future. Um, and that's partly true. Like sometimes there are prophecies in the scriptures, which uh, was talk of coming events um, that do indeed occur, which is, which is very special. But, but generally when you're reading the words of the prophets, you realize this isn't just about, you know, the future. It's really about um, a word, a message that God has for people that, that the prophets have some sort of connection to the transcendent, some sort of connection to God, and so he's able to. The prophets are able to speak the truth. Um, another another word from that, Jeff Cavins, he said, uh, a prophet is someone who goes out and reminds the people what God has said. So it's to proclaim God's will and to woo the people, to encourage them to come back to God, to come back to God's plan of of sheer goodness. So the prophets they want to do that. The prophets are they're inspired people. Um, the prophets, and usually they they do suffer a lot. So in many ways, they do prefigure the suffering of Christ. I think, um, you know, uh, Jeremiah. Right, we hear that a lot. Of Jeremiah. Jeremiah goes through a lot. Um, tear on every side. You know, he, he's he really goes through a lot. Jeremiah. So you definitely see a, a he's a Christ like figure. Jeremiah speaking the truth, but they don't like it. They don't want to hear the truth. Okay. Uh, a little, you know, so we did talk about Isaiah last time, and I'm going to backtrack just a little bit, but 
there's a few passages which I think we need to hit on, or just I think it's really good to hit on, and they go into the past month too. Um, last time we talked about Isaiah and particularly the virgin birth, uh, that prophecy. But um, there also are these uh, uh, servant songs, songs of the suffering servant. And these are the ones around Good Friday. Uh, you, we might remember these songs, or during, the, during Lent, hearing these, uh, these songs of the suffering servant that are kind of probably familiar to some of us. Or if we go to Stations of the Cross, actually, depending on what sort of meditation booklet that we have in the Stations of the Cross, um, it can it can be really the uh, you know so they'll have scripture verses from Isaiah. We remember that Isaiah is sometimes called uh, the fifth the fifth gospel. Uh, Saint Jerome called Isaiah a compendium of all the scriptures, but but in particular sometimes they call it the fifth gospel because it's, it seems to speak so clearly to um, to Jesus Christ. And I think you can really see that in the in the songs of the suffering servant. By that I mean that there are four or five, depending on you know which scripture scholar you're talking to, which are classified passages in Isaiah, which really are um, songs of this of the suffering servant. So I'll, I'll give you some examples. Isaiah chapter forty two verses one through four, that's one of them. And it goes like this: Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. He'll not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Yeah, so we might have heard that before, right? The, a bruised reed he will not break um, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. That's kind of a one that we would certainly see as pertaining to Christ. Now these passages... Uh, in the Hebrew context of referring to the, the nation of Israel or referring to the, the coming Messiah. For us, certainly, though, we, we look back and we say whether or not Isaiah exactly had the clearest picture or not when he was saying it, when he was writing this, of what he was talking about. Like, this this is clearly referring to Christ. Um, Isaiah 49. It was another one, verses 1 through 6. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Another, another good one right there. Um, I'll just continue. These are really, really beautiful passages. Isaiah 50, verses um, 4 through 7. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him that is weary. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been confounded. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13. Um, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men. So also in, in this passage right here, 50, chapters 52, 53, it was the prayer that I said at the beginning of, of this evening. Uh, you know, um, what have, who has believed what we have heard and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up like a, like a young plant, right? Or like a sapling, right? We hear some in other translations. And this particular point here that um, this one line and it was numbered with the transgressors yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors so there's, there's all these different elements here of like he was so marred beyond appearance of taking on sin right <laughs> you look at that and you're like they must be talking about Jesus right it's it's very clear with the eyes of faith um, it's really beautiful and you can just kind of feel I, I'd say feel it in your soul in a certain way that oh this must be referring to Christ um and there's one more too that I think some people say it is part of this collection of the uh, the uh, the songs of the servant, um, the suffering servant, or or maybe not. And that one is uh, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. So Jesus himself actually like, refers back to that passage, which is pretty amazing. So, so Jesus is also referring back to the suffering, you know, the suffering servant, you know, it, it, multiple times. And so I am he, right? This is, this is the one. I, I was prefigured. The prophet Isaiah was talking about me. And Jesus says that. So or basically, that's what he's come, putting across here. So really beautiful passages, uh, very powerful, very very strong in our tradition to in the liturgy, in the mass, and even in our devotions, sacred stations of the cross, you you come across these um, these uh, songs of the suffering servant. All right, um, so that's 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 kind of a final a final thing on Isaiah. There's, there's a lot there in Isaiah. Uh, there's a few things with with Ezekiel. Ezekiel, that was last month into this month. Ezekiel was a, a priest. Um, and Father Mike calls him the performance art, uh, performance art prophet, because he kind of like acts out certain things. He acts out a lot of things. Um, he has all these visions, very deep visions, Ezekiel, and he prophesied during Israel's captivity in Babylon. So that's he was in Babylon. That you know Jerusalem was already you know really like destroyed here for the most part. Um, and he started when he was twenty six years old, so he was pretty pretty young when he started. And his audience are the the exiled Jews in in Babylon. Um, in the Babylonian Empire, so um, he taught that their uh, really that their deportation is because of their personal sins and their their des- their willful desire not to repent of those sins, which is kind of like the, the classic theme through a lot of the prophets. It's like you know we're, we're depending on where the prophet falls before if it's beforehand, uh, like uh, like Jeremiah, it's like you got to repent, guys. Like you got to change your ways or else something bad's gonna happen. And you hear that in so many of the prophets, and then. They don't listen, and then the exile happens. So in the exile, it's, it's hey, guys, we told you this. You should have listened, but you didn't, and this is why we are where we are. But, um, but God still loves you. Right? God wants you. He's calling you back. And, and, yeah, you told a difficult path, but God hasn't abandoned you. He's still with you. He still wants you. To, to look at a, a latter, uh, yeah, kind of a part of from the latter section of, of Ezekiel, uh, a beautiful passage is uh, Ezekiel 36, a new heart and new spirit. This is another one which we, we hear in the Mass. So it might be one that you, uh, you, you is familiar to you. It's a great passage. I'll, I'll just read, read this as well here. It's chapter 36, verse 24. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your unclean, uncleanness, uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. You shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers, and you should be my people, and I will be your God. Wow, right? You have stony hearts, but God says, you know, I want to give you a new heart. I want to give you a heart of flesh, right? You know, I'm your God. I want, you know, you should dwell on the land and give to your fathers. You should be my people, and I will be your God. One of the recurring themes is that in the, in the Old Testament, certainly, but our faith is that our heart can be put, you know, on other things, on bad things. Or our heart can be hardened, right? It's, it's something that, that happens when sin hardens our hearts and that we're not, we're not accepting of, of, God's, of God's grace. Um, it's like in that, I think it was, um, I think it was in Judges. I could be wrong. I think it's Judges where it says everyone did what was right in, uh, in his own eyes or something like that. And you hear that multiple times. <laughs> And it's kind of right, like that's that's kind of a hardened heart, right? Everyone thinks they know the answer, right? Everyone thinks it's they're they're okay by themselves, um, and the heart becomes hardened, right? It's or like even further back in the Garden of Eden, you know, it's I, you know, eating the forbidden fruit because I want to decide what's good and evil. I don't want no one's gonna tell me what's good and evil. I'm like I'm gonna decide what's good and evil. Not I don't want God. I don't want the church. You know, no one else. But but um, but rather, right? Like what a what a beautiful approach to say, Lord, like. I'm yours. Like soften my heart. Help me to love what you love and and hate what you hate and and come to know your truth and to rejoice in it. And uh, right, if I'm if I'm not on your page, God, for me, right, for my heart. 
give me give me this this heart of flesh and uh, certainly right in the in the strict sense right you see this passage in Ezekiel referring to you know the nation of Israel um, but but really like the, the spiritual the, the spiritual takeaway from this like you know it's hard to say it doesn't go much beyond it goes beyond that as a, a sense that um, that goes much deeper um, that we can read it and say this this certainly applies to our spiritual lives and uh and to the work of jesus christ he he who suffers with our heart that god god can soften our heart sometimes through through a special gift that god gives us or through um sometimes through a different event in our lives like it's a uh something that we see see here it's it's unbelievable that god uses the babylonians he uses the all these people and um uses the the bad situations that um, in which the Israelites find themselves for their benefit, for their good. It has a kind of a, a pedagogy to it to teach them. And it's the same with us sometimes, right? That sometimes different different challenges, different sufferings um, can sometimes really make us realize, whoa, God, God's real. God's real. He, uh, I need to change my life or um, I want to grow closer to him. I, I've been ignoring God or maybe just I didn't realize this domain of my life that I haven't really given over to God yet. Uh but we offer it to him, and that's that's why we pray. That's why we we worship. That's why we um, receive the sacraments to soften our hearts so that God can mold them. Um, kind of like the uh, we can we can look at the the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Immaculate Heart of Mary, you know, to give us give us um, give us a heart like like the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so we can we can love <laughs> love the Sacred Heart like she does. You know, that's that's kind of the our our way as as Catholics. You know, to really. To, to look upon this the center of the center of emotion the center of love um, which kind of you know poetically is represented in, in the heart but but it's very powerful okay another one too of Ezekiel a very, very famous passage is, is the the valley of the dry bones um, and kind of an interesting one too what, what is going on here this you, we, we also hear this in, in the mass too at a I have to look up, you know, of, of what which, which masses, but um, where where this comes across in the lectionary. But uh, God says, prophesy to these bones, to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, "O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord." Now we think, all right, bones, right? Bones are dead. It's a sign of death. Nothing's nothing's going to come from the bones. Uh, but this is the power of this passage, right? That something can come from these bones. Um, that God does have this this power to do so. Even when things look the worst, right? God can still work there. And uh, so, what does Ezekiel say? So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the Spirit came into them, the bones, and they lived and stood upon their feet. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And it, it continues, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you home into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, says the Lord. Yeah, another great, great passage there. Uh, beautiful passage from Ezekiel. Um, opening the graves and uh, rising the people from the graves. And of course we have... And many, many different senses can be taken to this to this text, uh, and that's that's okay, right? You know, sometimes there are, there are multiple levels of meaning going on here, and even the scriptures themselves attribute multiple levels of meaning to the text, right? I think, um, like Jesus when he quotes the Old Testament, or someone like Saint Paul in the letters of of seeing them in in the context of the New Covenant, and uh, certainly here we have the idea that that which seemed to be dead. Um, in the literal sense, right, like at this point, you know, the, the nation of, of Judah, uh, that, that this, this could be resurrected here, or the, you know, um, here actually, talk, Ezekiel goes on talking about the two sticks, right, the tra stick of um, Joseph, meaning Israel, and joining it to the stick of Judah, and making them one stick. So basically, like, Ezekiel, you know, God's going to bring them all back. Somehow it's going to happen. Uh, we can also look into this passage, too, and, right, think of we certainly think of the resurrection from the dead, right? Christ's second coming. Um, that, that in some mystical way, right, we're getting our bodies back. That That is going to be happening. All right, that, in this passage, again, this is chapter 37. 
um, there's another great a great line here uh, about my servant David. Right, clearly this is after King David. So what is he talking about, Ezekiel? He's talking about the fulfillment of King David, the, the Messiah, the, the King of Kings. So Ezekiel says this, my servant David shall be king over them. And they shall, well, the Lord prophesying to Ezekiel. Or it's Ezekiel prophesying uh, the word that the Lord is giving him, rather. That's, that's going on in what I'm going to read now. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall follow my ordinances and be careful to observe my statutes. They shall dwell in the land where your fathers dwelt that I gave to my servant Jacob. They and their children and their children's children shall, shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will bless them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel. When my sanctuary is in the midst of them forevermore. Again, right, beautiful, right? The temple's gone. Like they're they're mourning the temple. Ezekiel, right? He's preaching to the you know the the Jews in exile, and their temple's totally destroyed. And so, what is Ezekiel talking about? The sanctuary that's going to come, you know, um, this dwelling place of God within them. I will be their God, and they should be my people. I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. I'll make an everlasting covenant with them that will you know will never be broken. And so, even when you read these texts, we, we get a sense. Okay, like. Something big is going to happen. Something definitive is going to happen here. It's not just something temporary anymore. It's not like there's going to be you know more more wars after this, more fallings. No, this is this is it. And my servant David, right? David's already come and gone. So no, he's talking about the successor to David, the ultimate successor to David, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, right? Um, so this this points us to something definitive, and you might say that um, right. It, obviously. Uh, in a sense, too, we're, we're still sort of in the middle of the story, you know, because Christ came, but but ultimately, that full fulfillment of the kingdom, you know, the, the church is here is kind of the kingdom in its sort of nascent, you know, beginning stages, but but really the fullness of the kingdom is to come in the second coming of Christ. So in a way, that this is yes, it's pointing to Christ. It's also pointing to when Christ comes again, right at the at the end of time. Great. Ezekiel, all right, a, lot, a lot there. We can, we can cover even more. But but let's maybe maybe switch over to our friend Jeremiah. Jeremiah, who a um, prophet in the land of Judah for almost his entire life. At the end, he was he was carted off to Egypt. And uh, yeah, he, he had it tough, Jeremiah. He, he's known as the prophet of doom. So that's, that's very tough, prophet of doom. Um, he's also the weeping prophet. He has a sensitive heart for the people. He loves the people. He loves God. No one wants to listen to Jeremiah. And uh, like many of the prophets, right? But it's very clear in Jeremiah. And he's speaking of the last days of Judah before the invaders destroy everything. So he, you know, he's heavily, you know, persecuted for this. And uh, he uses many different metaphors. Um, let's see, he, he crosses many different kings in Judah. So he, he's called to be a prophet in the 13th year of the king Josiah. Um, but he remains in Jerusalem after it fell to Nebuchadnezzar, the king Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire, in 597 BC and again 587. But eventually, he, like I said, he fled to Egypt. Um, and so he witnessed, right? He, he was given all these warnings, but he witnessed the, the destruction of his culture, of his whole world, really, um, even though he, he tried so hard to, to warn people. And it, it's really like a 50 year preaching for Jeremiah. Um, it's a word of repentance. But again, even, even though there's there's tough passages in Jeremiah, um, they're all, I mean, not, not to say that the tough can't be powerful, but there are also some ones which, which I think um, are, are as maybe challenging, but are still quite quite beautiful for us to, for us to take. And uh, this is right even right in the beginning. And uh, Jeremiah is such a great a great witness to us. I think we can see this right, right in the first few lines of, of Jeremiah chapter 1. So verse 4, we hear, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, 
Behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of the, for them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Yeah, really, wow. Beautiful. So much there. I mean, you can mind that. You take that for your spiritual meditation tonight and just, you know, you spend a lifetime meditating on that passage. It's it's beautiful, you know. Like God God knows us, right? God knows us inside and out. I mean, Jeremiah, of course, but, right, as we believe, as Catholic, right, that, that this this already applies to us, too, that, that he knows us. That God knows us. Even before you in the womb, I knew you, you know, when you're just a twinkle in God's eye, uh, so to speak. Um and this other element, too, that Jeremiah doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. Um, he says, like, Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth here. I'm a young guy, right? But, but God says, don't say that to you. For to whom I, you know, to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. God doesn't, um, what, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And it's certainly true with, with Jeremiah. He doesn't want the job. He doesn't feel like he has the qualifications for the job. And for us, too, as Christians, right, sometimes we feel like, God, I, right, why did you put me here? You know, why, why, why me? Why, why did I get this? It, you know, we can lose sight of all the good things God does and the, the beauty of the faith and, and the new life it gives us. And we can just look at the negative, like, oh, God, I, I really can't do this. And, right, what does God say? No, like, I'll be with you. Like, don't worry about it. You know, we're, we're walking together here. If you um, um, you have a chance to make it to Rome on a pilgrimage, or perhaps you can you just look it up online. Even uh, they, uh, there's a basilica of Saint Paul's, the so-called Basilica of Saint Paul's, outside the walls, and it's a little bit a little bit outside of of, of Rome. Um, and and the basilica, if you look at uh, at like the the front facing of the of the basilica outside this beautiful mosaic right and one of them they have uh they have pictures of the, of the four major prophets and so jeremiah being one of them and they have a scroll right and in the mosaics so you see this as you're looking at the basilica this huge gigantic church which holds the tomb of saint paul and uh there's a scroll and in hebrew like written in hebrew on the front and and that hebrew says um the following, the following line. This is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Again, this is chapter 1, verse 19. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Grant again, right? What a, what a line there. Um, they shall fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. Now, I don't know if that's maybe the artist who put that on the basilica, right? It's written in Hebrew, so you got to, someone has to, unless you can read Hebrew, you got to know that it's there. But, but it, um, uh, maybe it does apply to St. Paul, certainly, right? Um, I mean, to our Lord, right? To the life of the Christian, right? They'll fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. This is great. Great words to Jeremiah, just as he's getting started here. Uh, and, it, right, it, you know, kind of, for Jeremiah, at least, what does God say to Jeremiah later on? He, he says that, you know, um, I don't want you to marry. I don't want you to have any family because what you're doing, you know, at least for Jeremiah at this point, um, you know, I know that that's not going to be a good path for you like because you're going to go through some incredible suffering. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing with Jeremiah. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5. Uh, so we're kind of moving along here. We got an interesting point. Right? There, there's so many things we could take out of these scriptures. Um, it's it's an impossible task. But let's look at Jeremiah chapter five. There's something interesting here. Um, verse four through five. Then I said, "These are only the poor. They have no sense, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the law of their God. I will go to the great and will speak to them, for they know the way of the Lord, the law of their God." But they all alike had broken the yoke, and they had burst the bonds. And they broke, they'd broken the yoke. It means like, I'm rebellious, right? I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And, um, uh, you know, it, the, the point here is like, you know, it, it, people in Israel saying like, okay, you know, um, the poor have no sense. Like, I'm going to go to the great, 
I want to go to the, the, you know, the leaders and speak to them about what we should do. Uh, but what Jeremiah points out is that even the, the great, right, even those who maybe are, are put in shining lights, whether in ancient Israel or today, the well-educated, right, the people who have all the fame and fortune, right, um, even they can reject God, right? It's not, it's not uh, out of the question here. Um, even they can reject, reject, reject the sacred scriptures, reject God's revelation. Jeremiah, again, he, you know, he didn't speak what people wanted to hear. He speak what people needed to hear. Uh, it's not always well received. Um, I think, you know, it's a certain art. It's a certain art to do that. Um, and there are many false prophets in Jeremiah's time. Like, oh, don't worry, right? Everything's okay. Oh, this is great. Like, this is the way it should be, right? You know, there's no danger here. And no, Jeremiah's, you know, yelling out here. Like, there's a lot of danger. You guys better watch out. You're going to be conquered. Um, but, but they didn't listen. All right, Jeremiah 20. Here's another famous passage from Jeremiah. Um, chapter 20, verse 7. He says to God, O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. And you have prevailed. You, you sometimes a different translation is, O Lord, you have duped me, and I let myself be duped. Right, here in the, in the uh, Revised Standard Version. Oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. And this, this is kind of like uh, Jeremiah really sort of opening himself up to God here, saying, like, God, like, this is really difficult, even more than I thought so. Um, he doesn't want the job. He doesn't want to have to do this. And uh, Jeremiah says, For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. A little further on, he says, Curse, I mean, this is very powerful, very saddening. Curse be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Um, so, I mean, really, really, Jeremiah's in a dark place here. And it's not like, you know, hey, we should, we should follow Jeremiah in this sense, right? I, you know, no, because what, remember, like, what did, what, did, uh, what did God say to Jeremiah in the beginning? Um, he said, uh, before you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. So here, it's, it's kind of uh, very, very jarring to see, uh, like, where, what point Jeremiah is at right now, you know, in chapter 20, that he's kind of forgotten about that. He said, rather, like, I feel like I'm cursed the day which I was born. The day which my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. And so, here, it's, it's a point of reminder for us, too, like, in the darkness of our lives, wherever that, when those periods come, if we're in it now, if we're not in it now, if we coming through it, it's in the future, right? Things can get dark, but it's not that the Lord abandons us, that God is with us. He knows us. He doesn't test us beyond, beyond what we can handle. Um, and it's, it's like that for Jeremiah, too. All right. Um, let's keep going here. Yeah, another thing too Jeremiah points out is you know faithfulness to God, but but also it's you know being being good to your neighbor too, right? This is um, you know chapter twenty two verse three, and do no wrong or balance to the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, nor shed, shed innocent blood in this place. So, right, it, it's these are connected, right? Just like Christ's supreme commandments: love of God, love of neighbor, right? If you're if I'm living a life of prayer and it's not moving me to give more of myself outside of prayer, then, then something's wrong, right? Like that's, that means that something's not going right with the prayer life. Um, on the flip side, too, uh, is if I'm like, you know, constantly doing things for people that have no prayer life, right? Something's out of balance there, too, because uh, really, I mean, I can sound like a broken record here, but how do I really know that what I'm doing is good, right? The prayer life helps direct us. It gives us strength um, to be able to serve other people, know how to serve other people in the best way, and to be perceptive of their needs. And so God, God helps us in this. So there needs to be right a both and going on here. So it's interesting that Jeremiah even even brings that up. It's it's all part of this. All right. Uh, okay. Here, all right. Another big, big, big passage here. Jeremiah thirty one. Um, verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. There I have continued my faithfulness to you. This is God, God speaking here through Jeremiah. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And further on, verse 31, same chapter, chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant 
with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenants which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, and I showed myself their master, says the Lord. But this is a covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, I could, I could be wrong here. If my memory serves me correctly, I think this is the only time in the Old Testament where it specifically says new covenant. Um, or at least it's one of the few times where that's said. That like God's making, a, a, you know, Jeremiah's prophesying a new covenant here, which is like incredible. Um, you know, uh, I think in, in past lessons, uh, discussions on this Babylon year, I discussed some of the differences between covenant and contract because they're kind of similar. But a contract is sort of like, um, uh, you know, exchange of goods or, or services, usually a contract. Whereas a covenant, as, as some would define it, is, is a legal way to make someone a part of your family. A legal way to make someone a part of your family. That's kind of a covenant. So when God makes a covenant with us, right, he's bringing us into relationship. Covenants are about, about relationship. And so here's this prophecy of a new covenant, right? Like this is major. Um, and again, it's kind of like a, you can see there's something, um, something divine, I mean, obviously divine, but just something uh, otherworldly about this covenant. That Like there's something definitive, something that's, that's infinite about this, about this covenant that's coming. Uh, that, that doesn't need to be repaired. This is the, the new covenant, right, in Jesus Christ, uh, which, which we know about, which we believe, the covenant that Jesus brings. Um, also let's talk about too, you know, that laws written on hearts, and this is something that we could we could also talk about a lot of, of covenants written on or laws written on hearts, and right certain beliefs of the church too have seen the natural law that even all people, even not Catholics, have a certain law written on their hearts. A certain law can be kind of fuzzy in certain cases, but but really like all of us have a certain natural law to which we can appeal to, um, and that too, right in a life lived in Jesus Christ, uh, the moral law becomes clear to us um, how we should act and that God helps us in forming our consciences to help us to act um, more in accordance with his will. So this is a grace that, that God gives us, um, that he does write upon our hearts and uh, this law, God, God aids us in this process. All right, uh, how about we go to we go to Daniel for a little bit. Um, we've heard a lot about Daniel. If you, we've been listening to the podcast, uh, if not, we can talk about it a little bit. So the the first I mean, Daniel's kind of a, a fun book in many ways. Uh, fun in the sense there's a little more narrative going on here, and so we might be thirsting for some narrative after some of the some of the prophecies, um, which which don't have a ton of narrative sometimes, but. Um, the first part of Daniel sets like kind of, um, you know, uh, it's the first part of Daniel is a lot of, like kind of stories, and the second part more is like revelation. So actually, like in the first part of Daniel, Daniel's referred to in the third person, whereas the second part of Daniel, um, you know, we have kind of a first person, it's like first person. I Daniel saw this happen, uh, so that's a interesting little division there. Um, Daniel one, we start out Daniel chapter one, we start out with a, a great story. Uh, that um, of Daniel, you know, being in exile with his with his buddies, and we'll get into them later. But um, but he was going to eat this rich food of the king. That he he wanted to eat vegetables and and water, uh, and they said, you know, that you know that the person feeding them said, like, well, we can't do that because then you're going to be you're going to be too thin. And no, like, we, we trust in God. We're going to do the right thing. You're ready to eat it. Bring us vegetables and water. And we'll be good. And so it turns out that they were better fed and stronger than everyone else. So um, it points us this, like, especially if they're hearing a lot in in the Old Testament of people who really, you know, fall off the wagon. I mean, even like David or Solomon or all these kings, uh, even the ones that are so-called good kings in um, in Judah, right? Like, it's like usually there's something off here. And we're finally, I don't, I don't know, maybe my own, perspective might here like as we're getting closer to Christ you also do see these figures who are more Christ-like uh, 
and uh, certainly not. I'm not saying that there's big of um, big of figures in salvation history, as someone like Moses or, or David or Solomon, but but you do see some incredible you know acts from these people, and uh, that that includes Daniel, um, and so the, you know they're great examples of how do you how do you live in exile? How do you live when everyone's against you? And they, they do a great job of showing us that of trusting in God. Uh, second Daniel, second chapter of Daniel talks about. Nebuchadnezzar's dream, um, and so Daniel doesn't just have to interpret the dream; he has to kind of know what the dream is to to, um, to help Nebuchadnezzar here. And uh, it's it's the one with the great statue. We we hear this too in the in the lectionary. Um, I, and I I could be mistaken. Sometimes some of these some of these readings might be for daily masses. So I think if if you're uh, if you do make a habit of going to daily mass or Sometimes a, a good prayer practice is actually, even if I can't make it to daily mass, reading the scriptures for that that are being said at daily mass. That's not a bad, a bad practice, a very good one. And so we might hear about about ones like this, about this great statue, uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You know, head of gold, which represents Babylon, and so uh, you know we have chest of silver, which ends up representing Persia, bronze and Greece, um, iron. Father Mike makes this Rome. I I think. You know, those aren't necessarily spelled out here in the in the scriptures, and I think scholars would, would debate a little bit what you know what countries are aligned there. Um, but I do I do think Father Mike has a great great interpretation, uh, especially like you know if we do if we do consider this um, you know feet partly of iron, partly of clay, of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, um, referring to kind of Rome, like Rome collapses uh, collapses in it. It's replaced by this stone, which is not come out of the earth by human hands, but by God Himself. He gives a great mountain over all the earth. So this idea that well, Jesus comes during the time of the Roman Empire. So if there's a prophecy here, that if this does represent the Roman Empire, that well, who's the mountain, right? That, you know, of God that's coming, um, the kingdom of God being being the church, at least in its beginning stages. Um, yet yeah, even chapter two, verse forty-four. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. Once again, right, this very, uh, very powerful prophecy. All right, what a, a cool passage here is Daniel chapter 3 with uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Um, so they were already mentioned earlier in, the, in Daniel. We're, we're, this is chapter 3 here. And Father Mike goes through the names of... of um, and Azra, Mishael, and Daniel, and what they what they mean, and why their their names were changed in Babylon, and what, what that those names mean. So Hananiah means beloved by the Lord. Azariah means the Lord is my help. Mishael, which is basically Michael, means who is like God. And Daniel means God is my judge. And so all of these names of Daniel and his, and his cohorts here, Hananiah, Azra, Mishael, they all refer to the God of Israel. Right, that's the, the deepest meaning of their name. Um, but in Babylon, their names are changed. They and uh, it's changed in a way that's that's not very good. Um, Belteshazzar is, is Daniel's new name, which means Bel's prince. Bel is a false god of, of Babylon. So Daniel's new name refers to this false god, Bel's prince. Hananiah, which we learned means beloved by the Lord in Hebrew, his name is changed to Shadrach, um, which is means illuminated by the sun god. So not, not the real God, illuminated by the sun God. That's the name that's given to him. Mishael, um, you know, is changed to, uh, right, Mishael's name was who is like God. It's Michael. See, the Meshach, who is like Shaq. We're not talking about the basketball player here. Shaq, one of the Babylonian goddesses, right? So who is like Shaq. And Azariah, whose name, uh, whose name meant the Lord is my help, his name is changed to Abnego, um, servant of Nego, which is one of the false gods of Babylon. So you take these awesome names, right? awesome Hebrew names, Daniel, Hanani, Azariah, Mishael, and they all refer in, their, in the meaning of the names to the God of Israel, to the one God, the true God. And what happens in the, in the exile, that their names are changed, which focus on pagan gods. So a, a, kind of a, tra a tragedy there. Um, but they do keep that identity, of course. They do keep their, their own identity. It does show, though, that, you know, opposing powers they want to destroy anything to do with with the true God um, yeah it, just uh, um, as we get into this passage here 
uh, we have this, uh, this, um, you know, the song here, on the song of the three young men. We have this, uh, prayer of Azariah in the furnace, the song of the three young men, which happens in chapter three. Um, what's, what's going on there? So, so basically, like, King Nebuchadnezzar wants idol worship. He makes this golden image. Everyone's supposed to worship this golden image, but, um, you know, they're all pretty pretty strong here of saying, like, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. So Nebuchadnezzar wants to throw them in a fiery furnace because they won't worship this false god. And, uh, right, uh, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael say, okay, right, um, you know, we've no need to answer you. You should know this already, basically. And, uh, yeah, we believe in God so much that he might deliver us from this burning fiery furnace um, and deliver us out of your, your hand, O king. But if God decides not to do that and not to deliver me um, or not deliver us, um, we still don't worship the false gods. We have that strong that, that strong of faith in God that, you know, maybe God will deliver us, maybe he won't, but we know that what, what you're worshiping is false. So really, really powerful here, really strong, strong faith. Um, but the um, we see right uh, when they they're thrown into the furnace and verse 26 but the angel of the Lord came down into the furnace to be with Azariah and his companions and drove the fiery flame out of the furnace and made the mist of the furnace like a moist whistling wind so that the fire did not touch them at all or hurt or trouble them and then we have this uh this, this song of the three young men. So they, they notice this, that, okay, right, this moist, whistling wind. The fire's not hurting us. We're fine. So what do they decide to do? They give this incredible prayer to God. It's, um, like, it's really a prayer of creation, right? Bless, you know, bless the Lord, frost and snow. Sing praise to him and highly exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, lightnings and clouds. Sing praise to him and highly exalt him forever. Um, let the earth bless the Lord cold and summer heat bless the lord all winds you know stars of heaven it's, it's going through all of creation and they're calling upon you know you know they're calling upon these three young men in the fiery furnace all the creation to bless the lord it's really it's really a beautiful prayer and actually uh uh the prayer of the church the so-called liturgy of the hours you might be aware of this that um if you go to a monastery where where nuns are praying or uh, monks or also um, religious sisters usually would pray at least part of the Liturgy of the Hours, and, and priests, I pray it too, uh, five times a day. It's uh, almost like an extension of the Mass, but you pray Psalms, just like Jesus would have prayed the Psalms in Hebrew. So um, we make a promise to pray the Psalms. And uh, sometimes it's not just Psalms, it's other passages as well. And so every other Sunday, we pray this passage, uh, this Song of the Three Young Men. Uh, on Sunday, so it's a really a great prayer of, of rejoicing, of of calling upon God's creation to bless the Lord. Um, so very familiar to, to many many in the church, and and not just priests and religious. Like any any Catholic can pray the Liturgy of the Hours, the, the prayer of the church, um, which is something maybe we'll talk about someday too. How to how to do that and, and how to how to access that. Uh, one of the things too in this in this great prayer of you know calling upon creation to bless the Lord it does sort of point to our belief of creation that creation does give glory to God creation is not God but it, it's God's creation um, God made it and it does give glory to God and it kind of does so automatically right in a poetic way the three young men are calling upon creation to bless the Lord but um, but really like uh, plants and animals and a rock right just by their very existence they give glory to God um, because they don't have free will, uh, not like not like we do as humans. So um, that's the, the interesting thing about us, right? Because we have free will, again, yeah, humans, and so we make a choice whether or not to bless the Lord, right? You know, creation doesn't, right? You know, the mosquito blesses the Lord just by doing his mosquito thing, right? Or the sea urchin, or the dolphin. Um, you know, the dolphin by its very nature blesses the Lord. Um, but for us, we have this incredible gift of free will that God wants us to freely love him. Right? We make a choice to love God. 
it's something it's something very powerful but, but really meaningful that we can say yes to God that it's on us and and God trusts us um, he, he he allows us to say no to him right? it's a very powerful thing all right um, we're getting to the end here um, yeah I think if you were listening to today's uh, today's final final one um, what was it 245 I think we are today and uh, it's the it's um, very, very interesting. It's some interesting passages. You know, Daniel's thrown into the lion's den for a second time and, and managed to, um, doesn't manage to get eaten. Uh, he also, um, there's a story of Dave Daniel kind of outsmarting the Persian priests or the, these priests of Bel, the false god, because, um, you know, they're, they're sneaking up into the temple at night and taking the food, which supposedly this, this false god is eating, uh, and so these priests are tricking the king and thinking like, oh yeah, this false god's eating the food. And so Daniel uh, sprinkles ash on the floor. So when everything's sealed up, um, these people, the fall of the priests and their wives and their children don't know that the ash is there. So they make all these footprints from a trap door in the bottom. Um, so they, they come up when they think no one's looking, they eat the food. They make all these footprints they don't know that though in the ash and they go back down and they think they've tricked the king again. But really, like Daniel says, no, we see your footprints in the ash. Um, it's clear that you're going to this trap door eating the food, and this really is a false god. Then there's this dragon, and you know the dragon's revered by the Babylonians. Um, he uh, and Daniel makes is very ingenious. He puts pitch, which is I think kind of like a asphalt or like a tar, fat and hair. And he makes these cakes, which he feeds to the dragon, and the dragon eats them, and, and it's burst open. Um, and he sort of the lion's den, and then he gets saved. So, it really, it points us to this fact that, um, really, uh, you know, th- this is what faithfulness looks like, right? That, um, you know, D- Daniel's and Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they're, they're risking it all. <laughs> they're really risking it all. They, you know, they're in exile, they're far from home, they're people who don't believe like them, and sometimes don't really like them, they're more powerful than them, and they put it all out there. They, they risk their whole lives for the sake of God and with trust and kind of a, a serenity that goes along with it. So it's, it's very powerful. Um, I, uh, and I know this is, there's a Polish story that I, now I wonder if it's from, maybe you're, you're aware of this. Um, so the, the capital of Poland is Warsaw, but in southern Poland you have Krakow, and that's the old capital And uh, in, in years past. And so there's this legend of a, of a dragon and uh, the king said, you know, whoever kills this dragon will be, will be able to marry the princess. And so this one, I think, I think he's a peasant. Uh, you know, he wants to marry the princess, but, you know, he's not a knight or anything. So all these knights go and they get, the dragon eats them or something. But he, um, he has a very smart idea. He, uh, this peasant takes a sheep and really like stuffs the sheep with tar. And so the dragon thinks that the, it's a sheep, so the dragon eats it, and then I think he just, you know, can't breathe fire anymore or something. So, so that uh, this peasant wins, and, and it's a marrying the princess. But now I, I look at this passage, and I think, wow, maybe that story is based off of Daniel because uh, I just recognize that. So you have all these le- different legends, right, that are inspired by our Christian culture and and from the you know the Jewish tradition as well. Um, David made his cakes, which ultimately defeated this beast. But all right. Um, end of time you know a few more minutes if there's any any questions out uh out there if, um i don't know if anyone anyone has any anything on their on their minds from these passages thanks for tuning in once again All right. Well, thanks for, for joining as we continue to go through the sacred scriptures. Of course, a thanks to Father Mike Ascension Press for the, for the podcast. Uh, and yeah, next time we'll be meeting, we'll be covering the Gospel of Matthew. So that's an ex- exciting thing, like a good coming attraction as we go forward here. So let's, let's close with a, a Hail Mary. From the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, 
now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you soon. See you at church. Peace.